This is Aswan, Egypt's hottest city, but also my favorite. Egypt. We all know its most famous attractions. Pyramids, Valley of the Kings, etc. However, there are many places that tourists do not visit. Those arriving in Aswan visit Philae Temple and take the four-hour drive to Abu Simbel and back. Yet, between these two famous sites, there are many places that get overlooked. My name is Curtis Ryan Woodside. I'm an Egyptologist and filmmaker. I've invited my friends to come with me to explore these overlooked sites and to set sail on a once-in-a-lifetime journey southwards on Lake Nasser. Amazing. I'm joined by Stephanie Jarvis, the creative mind behind the insanely successful Chateau Diaries, as well as other friends who all love ancient Egypt. The colors, the preservation, absolutely stunning. We discover mysterious tombs. We're in the underworld. So this is what it must feel like for the mummies. An island filled with thousands of years of history. He honestly had a pet lion. Yes. Learn about the connection between Egypt and their ancient enemies to the south, the Nubians, as we explore the forgotten wonders of southern Egypt. You should be able to see this without tons of tourists around. From the Valley of the Lions. The gods have got skin made of gold. It really brings it to life looking at it with you. To a dream come true arrival at Abu Simbel. This is incredible. It's so perfect. I've been wanting to come here since I was 18 years old. Come with on this incredible voyage filled with adventure, intrigue, and history. What better way to start our journey than at the bustling Aswan Market? It's really pretty, isn't it? It's so beautiful. Isn't it gorgeous? I love it. This market is not only for tourists, but for locals as well, and is filled with the heady aroma of exotic spices. These spices have been imported into Egypt for thousands of years, from deep south in Nubia, and as far as Punt, modern-day Eritrea or Ethiopia. Hopping onto a motorboat on the Nile allows us to experience the vast amount of cultures that surround this body of water in Aswan. From the remains of the ancient Egyptian Nilometer on Elephantine Island, and we pass the old cataract hotel inspired by modern Arab decor. This spot also inspired Agatha Christie's death on the Nile. Right. Welcome to Aswan! Thank you, I love it! It's absolutely incredible. Oh, well, We're right. riding on the top of a boat. Where are we going, Curtis? Oh, uh, <laughs> we're going to the Nubian village. We're going to go have dinner and look at the market. That okay. sounds amazing. Do more damage. Yes. Are we going to find lots of yes. yes, very <laughs> traditional. We need a boat like that. A oh, party boat! Party boat. This setting can't be more different from ancient times, yet we feel connected on this thought-provoking sail towards the Nubian village. Welcome to the Nubian village, Stephanie. It is going to be quite an experience for you, because Nubian is a very different culture to Egyptian. They're all about color and light, and it's really something quite special. I love the colour, I love the geometric patterns. Everything, yeah. all the houses have this beautiful colour on it. So, I can't wait to show you the market. It's going to be like really traditional things. Are they fun things? Fun yeah, things. not Egyptian. Not Egyptian, Nubia. All right, let's have a look. Let's go. The people living in this village were relocated from northern Sudan when Egypt created Lake Nasser. 
I like that one. This one. I like this one. And yet out of the tragedy of their relocation, they have revived their culture. The Nubians here have regained their joy on this beautiful island with their infectious smiles. Hi. There's, there's this little man here, I like him. Which one? This one. Yeah, yeah. I'll take I'll take him. Put this back. Man and the woman. Man and woman. Yeah. Yeah, man and woman. They match, look. Yeah. Aren't they cute? Okay. Okay. Come. I need to try it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Open here. Right one. This one. Yes. Now? Change. No, 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 no. No, no. So much has changed, yet stayed the same. The Nubian cuisine is one of my favorite in Egypt, and I always make sure to visit this restaurant when I arrive. Yeah, I'll definitely have some of that. It's beautiful. <laughs> Morning, Curtis. Off to Kubait El Hawa, which is the mountain here that has tombs dating back to the 6th dynasty. To reach these 4,400 year old tombs up on the hill, we have a special form of transport. I just hope everyone's up for an adventure. <laughs> Lean back, guys. Hold on. This is a bit surreal. Isn't it awesome? <laughs> Just think the spirits of the ancient dead get to enjoy this glistening view every day. This tomb belonged to a man who was the ruler of Elephantine Island. He was not a monarch, he was given independent rule. Thus, we call him a nomarch, Sarenput. A lot of these tombs were reused yes. in later dynasties as mass burials. Yes. And in here, so if you look here, Stephanie, you can actually see the human remains. We can see someone's lower vertebra. My goodness, poor person. Just step into here a little bit. You'll see there is the elephant. Yes. And that's elephant team moon. You see the T is the loaf of bread, the square thing, or the round dome with the flat bottom. Okay. And the, the, the N is actually water. Nile. Nile. So elephant team. And that little mound means place. So place of elephant team. Fascinating. Yeah. Ruled by. Siren put at the time. And these were the offerings that he was giving in terms of food? Yes. So his son here is offering food to Siren put. Pomegranates, duck, looks like bread, a cow, and then jars of wine and beer at the bottom. It's a very decent meal. That's a very decent meal. And you can see his wife is offering something even better. She's got a whole leg of beef over there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you look on this side, you can see the tomb was never properly finished because the grid is still visible for the, the carvings. That's so touching, actually. The thought that we can see the workings out still of the artist. Yeah. Where would they have brought the offerings? Because it might just be me, but there was a creepy looking stone as we came in that had a little ridge or was like <clears throat> um, So that's water. Oh. So water was poured over the offerings to yes. purify them. Okay. And then water. And that table is called a head. This tomb dates back to 2284 BC and was built for an official named Senebi. This is a false door, one of the biggest false doors I've ever seen. The function of a false door is so that offerings would be left for the dead and the spirit of the dead could come out and receive the offerings. So this is a portal to heaven. This is why I bring this little light with me. Yes. 
This is the burial chamber of the tomb owner, Sebebi. So he was hidden away from any grave robbers? Yeah. This would have been filled in and then covered with hieroglyphs. Yes. So they couldn't find the body. So it looked like just a normal wall. Exactly. Yet not all tombs are beautifully decorated like Senebi and his father's. Other tombs, during the later period, during the economic downturn, are quite derelict in their decoration. Are you ready for an adventure? Always. Um, but does it all go down now? Yes, let's go. Oh, you bring me to the best places, Curtis. I'll try. Take my hand. Ooh. And we will never see them again. There's a lot of bats down here. They are. They're coming in there. What's amazing is the sand. No. All the dust in the air. See. Yes. Oh, there's some bats. Oh! oh. <laughs> Sorry, didn't mean to intrude. So this is what it must feel like for the mummies. Yeah. We're seeing the outer bit, but this is where the mummies were resting. This is your life. Yeah. Oh. I prefer it out there. Shall we go back? Do you want to go? Let's go together. Whoa. Oh, yeah, it goes the round there. there. Look, follow the bats, they're all going round there. If this collapses, my mother will kill you all over again. It's okay, because we'll be dead. It goes down. How does it go down? Oh, wow. Where are we? We are going into the underworld. It really yeah. feels like it. It's almost as if the bats are trying to get us That's to follow them. They keep coming up and going, look, look, this way, this way. That's this the way. burial chamber down there. That's the burial chamber. Oh, don't go too fast, Stephanie. No, I won't. I'm just going to look at the burial chamber. It's okay. Stephanie, I can't believe how far we are from the others. We are only meant to come a few feet, but it's too fascinating. It's we're too fascinating. We're following we're, the bats. We're in the underworld. Okay. Okay. Okay, you see down there. I can actually see a piece of... He's a bat. A piece of his sarcophagus. Really? There's the sarcophagus. Oh my god. Yes, it? yes, yes. That cuts we, we are in a sixth dynasty burial chamber. This is amazing, Curtis. I was not expecting this. I love it, but Stephanie, I think it's time to get back. <laughs> Let's go. But mommy's still waiting up there looking pretty anxious. Yeah. I think I better rejoin the living. Let's go. Mummy up there. Oh. Oh, light. Oh. I love it. Let's go. Okay. Are you okay? I feel like Lara Croft. <laughs> oh. Just shame we're coming out with no treasure to eat. Whew. We made it. Oh. oh. That was amazing. Thank you. What Thank marvelous you. things did you see? Amazing. We went all the way around and then down. We followed the bats and it went down into the actual tomb. And after that thrilling visit, I think we'll call it a day. Water is the lifeline of Egypt, obviously, and it is not uncommon to find canals such as this built into the desert, providing much relief for the locals. Our relief from the scorching Aswan sun comes from this laid-back cafe, built in the shadow of the tombs. Our next stop is the mysterious Elephantine Island, a place filled with traces of ancient life and death. We have something here yeah. which is very typical even in today's world, right? Yes, right. Yeah. What is this? This is something to do with... I first thought it was a divorce contract because of everything that the man had to pay. Uh -huh. 
but it's something else. No, it is marriage contract, like a deal between the man and his wife. If he divorces her, he will pay that and that for her. Okay, if like he, a prenuptial agreement. Yes, like agreement. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so they discussed all their life together. If they got divorced, what he has to pay. If yeah. they uh, be in conflict together, what they have. It is like a map to their life. Yeah. Yeah. Something like we have today. Exactly. Exactly. And it's written in hieratic. Yeah. Which is very difficult to read, actually, because it's the, the cursive form of of hieroglyphs. Yes, it is a for the public. It is yeah. a, yes, the font of the public. Exactly. But like exactly. the hieroglyphs may be much easier for us to read than hieroglyphs yeah. than other dancers. So this is a contract from the time of Nectanebo. Nectanebo is the second. Yes. Yeah. And Nectanebo lived in this area of Egypt. He built the temple. He controlled this area and demonized this area yeah. during his time. And you know, Nectanebo was the last pharaoh from the pharaonic. Last uh, native Last pharaoh. native pharaoh. Good. Exactly. Good to mention that. Exactly. Last native pharaoh. <laughs> so we have, yeah, this contract. And inside here, he's talking about how he has to pay so much linen to his wife. Yes. Um, how much grain, if they have children. Silver. Silver as well. Oil. 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 Yes. Okay. And also uh, uh, the relation how she wash his uh, uh, dresses and uh, how she deal inside the house. Yeah. Okay. So for her as well, not just from his side. No. From the, him, his side and the hair side. Okay. Her side, his side and the hair side. Well, that's good. That's good. Yeah. So it was a mutual agreement between the two of them. Yes. Yeah. And it is something very, very civilized to organize their life. It is like a deal to not after that someone say, I didn't say that. Exactly. It's like contract and yeah. paper. And every one of them has like a cubby. He can choose this cubby if they get in argument or problem. Yeah. It's like what they say. Happy wife, happy, happy life. life. Happy wife, happy life. Yeah. Or in this case, uh -huh. happy concubine, happy pharaoh. Happy concubine, happy pharaoh. Yeah, that easy, yeah. The island's own independent colonial style museum contains traces of many different cultures, like this Nubian vase, and even ancient Christian and Jewish clay figurines. A grand display of Greco-Roman coins. These appear to be crafted out of terracotta and glazed in gold and traces of its original pharaonic ancient Egyptian roots. We can tell that this statue found on the island is of Sesostris III from his unique facial features. Giant. Very subtle changes, uh, but <laughs> there are differences. Sesostris I, II and III left huge legacies here at Elephantine during their expeditions to conquer Nubia. And of course, pieces dedicated to the gods, like the local god of Elephantine, Khnum the Ram. All the pieces on display in this museum were found on this island, making it unique. My favorite pieces in this museum are these bronze cobra uray, which would have sat atop a pharaoh's crown. Imagine how these once glistened in the sun. Many pharaohs sought out to conquer Nubia to the south of Egypt, and they left their mark on this island, the boundary between Nubia and Egypt. With the goddess Hathor smiling out, this temple was built by Tutmosis III, all the way back in 1479 BC. This temple was dedicated to Egypt's patron god, Amun shown with blue skin in his hidden form. Tutmosis III led several successful campaigns into Nubia. However, this temple was began by his stepmother, Hatshepsut. Tutmosis III's son and successor, Amenhotep II, built a small chapel here, and his son, Tutmosis IV went on to build a beautifully decorated chapel. After one of his campaigns in Nubia, 
and he dedicated it to a Nubian god. Tutmosis IV being offered the key of life from the Nubian god of this region, Mandulus. This island has layers upon layers upon layers of habitation. Ancient Egyptian homes built over by Roman homes, then built over again by Christian and Jewish homes. Elephantine was a great meeting and trading point for thousands of years, yet Aswan's export was granite. And now here, lying on its side, made out of granite from this area from Aswan, some of the best granite in Egypt. And this Naos would have housed a statue to Khnum, the ram-headed god. So that was truly fascinating. And I mean, the, the fact that Elephantine is obviously the cross-section of a lot of ancient history and, and even into the modern world and, and uh, cultural as well is absolutely fascinating. Because of the building of Lake Nasser, many of the sites that had pieces relocated needed to be housed, and a beautiful museum was constructed, the Nubian Museum in Aswan, where we are heading to learn more about the vast mix of cultures here, like this colossus of Ramses II that was relocated. Lake Nasser, 350 in Egypt and 150 in Sudan. Lake Nasser is the largest man-made lake in the world. And because of the lake, many places were flooded for forever, including its prehistoric sites. Here we have a pre-dynastic burial. We see these quite often. But what's interesting, these pre-dynastic burials are done in a way where there is ritual taking place. These people were not just thrown into the ground. They were placed with things that they would need in the next life, like pottery and tools for their work. So even the thousands of years ago, 5,000, 6,000 years ago, before Egypt became an empire, before Egypt was conquered by Pharaoh Nama and reunited, they had this idea of afterlife. In 744 BC, Egypt was in the midst of another intermediate period. The country had become divided. The Nubians in the south saw the gap in Egypt's strength they invaded and took over power of Egypt. This statue is of a Nubian high priest. His name is Horem Aket. And Horem Aket is actually the name of the Great Sphinx of Giza. It's very interesting that he took the same name of Horem Aket, the horizon of Horus. He's a high priest from Nubia, and he's the only person that we have shown with an Ankh necklace around his neck. The only person in the whole of Egyptian statuary, he was shown unique. He is the royal descendant of the founder of the 25th dynasty. Shabaka was his father and the third Nubian king to rule Egypt. Yet these Nubians did not rule Egypt for more than 100 years. They were chased out by the Assyrians in a great battle with the last Nubian ruler to fully control Egypt. These giant Shabtis belonged to a great Nubian pharaoh who came into Egypt after his forefathers had taken Egypt back from invaders and brought the religion back up to its original standing. Shortly after though, the Nubians were chased out of Egypt yet again. But these are some great examples of the funerary practices of Pharaoh Taharqa. Taharqa was this last great Nubian Pharaoh to fully rule over Egypt. The enemy of the ancient Egyptians for thousands of years were only able to rise up against them for less than a hundred years. The Egyptians then defeated the invading Assyrians and took back control. Trade still continued with the Nubians. This is a little golden pendant of the god Horus. And what's great about this is, in Nubia, Horus was known as the Golden Horus. So this is the Egyptian and Nubian coming together. And Nubia means 
land of gold. So therefore, Horus is golden. This statue shows a Nubian man, Iri Ketakana. He was sent in the 7th century BC into Egypt as a representative of the King of Kush to discuss political and trade relations. The Nubians' reign in Egypt had heavily influenced their culture. They went back to Nubia and built pyramids and temples in the style of the Egyptians. They continued many traditions from the ancient Egyptians. The Kushite Nubian king Aspelta, shown here on an Egyptianized stela. This was his coronation before the god Amun and Mut at Jebel Barkal, down deep in Sudan, from where he ruled in the 6th century BC. This is the last native Egyptian pharaoh, Nectanebo II. He was conquered by the Persians in 343 BC. This museum contains amazing pieces recalling the memory of ancient Egypt and ancient Nubia. Like this, the daughter of one of Egypt's greatest pharaohs, Ramses II. In temples, they would have sacred animals, like at Komombo, they had a sacred crocodile. And when that animal died, it was mummified, similar to the Apis bull, which we see at the Serapium at Saqqara. Here, at Elephantine, they worshipped Khnum, the ram, and here is one of those sacred rams that they kept in the temple. Once it died, it was mummified and covered in an elaborate golden mask, similar to a pharaoh. Yet in later dynasties, gold was not only reserved for a pharaoh. Nearing the death of Cleopatra, many people were decorated with gold in the afterlife. These coffins were found at Kubeit al Hawa, high up on the hill of Aswan. Coming from thousands of years apart, these are some of the most unique coffins you will see. We are on our way to one of Aswan's most popular tourist sites. When you see it, you will understand just why it is so popular. A site filled with history, beauty, mystery and more. On the dock, before we board our boat to reach the island, we pass through a market filled with colourful handmade trinkets and locally mined gemstones. The island we are going to was relocated when Lake Nasser and the High Dam were created. When the British built this dam here, uh, on 1890 and they also make it higher and higher until 1902. Of course, when you have a dam, you will have a lake behind the dam. So this lake made like part of Nubian to leave the area to other places in Egypt. And the problem is the, the temple of Isis submerged under the water. The life come back again to this temple when they built the, uh, the high dam at the south. So the level of water in this area became lower. So it's, uh, when it became lower, so they could to see a new island appear. The Egyptian government informed UNESCO so we can see a new island, we can move the temple on it. So one dam gave the death to the temple, and the other dam gave the life to the temple. Wow. Almost as if spawned from the water, we see the beautiful and majestic Philae Temple. Built mainly in the Greek period 2,300 years ago, this temple was dedicated to Isis. The passionate and powerful goddess shown in unique scenes here. We have the goddess of the, the Delta, playing the harp to baby Horus and Isis. Isis became pregnant spiritually from her deceased husband, Osiris. And the pharaoh was seen as Horus on earth. She also was associated with queens. In the form of the goddess Isis Hathor, 
It's a lady called Alison, Alison, and she is the sister of Cleopatra. Not the great Cleopatra VII, but one of the other Cleopatras from before her. And we all know Cleopatra was Isis on Earth. I'm going to take you to see the top of Philae Temple. From up here, we can appreciate the splendor of this landscape, yet life was not always as beautiful as it appears, as seen on one scene. I want to show to you the most special piece, in my opinion, in this temple. Here we have the god Mandulus, mm -hmm. the god from Nubia, mm -hmm. depicted here in this temple. And this text written right here is the final hieroglyphic written in ancient Egypt. Really? Around 300 AD, they came in here to convert the Egyptians. This was the last hideaway for the Egyptians. They came in here, the Coptic Christians came in to convert them. This man wrote a little note explaining that on the 24th of August, he was writing this here, asking that his spirit be saved from the people invading here. Oh, and the most sad thing is, it looks like when he finished writing, something happened. Oh. Yeah. His chisel hits onto here. So it's, it's a dramatic it's and the sad final, final one. Wow. Yeah, it's very special. Very special That's indeed. Fascinating story. This structure, known as the Bed of the Gods, was built by Roman Emperor Trajan, where he would arrive on his boat to visit the temple. There is so much to see here at Philae Temple. It's one of my favorite temples because you just get a sense of the importance of the religion of the ancient Egyptians. From one ancient Egyptian marvel to another, sailing. Nothing beats a sunset ride on a felucca. This bronze-capped mound is in fact a Roman tomb built in the middle of the Nile. We are heading a little bit off the window, but that's nice. And it appears that we've allowed Simon to flex his sailing muscles and steer the boat. It seems we've spent most of this trip on the water. Yet the ancient Egyptians would have done the same. The Nile can be seen as their ancient highway. The beauty of Aswan is almost completely untouched by modern hand. I think that all the Châtelains of France and you, Cassis, we should club together and buy that house. Look, it's a doer up, huh? It's got its own little mooring. Looks in need of love. Actually, the one next would be perfect for Dan. <laughs> he likes a challenge. <laughs> this is bigger. And there are more of us. I do like the colour turquoise. <laughs> A more modern monument lies on the horizon, the mausoleum of the wife of Aga Khan built in 1956. It feels as though it could have been thousands of years ago, here with a papyrus, exactly. just drifting along. And the mud brick houses just on the islands, this is how people have been living here for thousands of years. 
and it's I, stunning. It's my favorite part of, of Egypt is this part. But what I want to tell you about is you see these stones here. Yes. These big gray stones. This is throughout the entire cataract here. Do you know what that's about? No, I haven't got a clue. <laughs> <laughs> but I'd like to find out. <laughs> well, these stones is what gives the island with the main temple and the main dwelling here its names. So this is why the area is called Elephantine. It's because these stones, the people when they came down here believed that they were shaped like oh, elephants. Oh yes, yeah, big gray blocks on yeah. the horizon. Yeah, and the god Hapi, the god of the Nile, he is believed to live underneath these stones, con and controlling the Nile underneath the stones. Okay, so that's his home just that's, there. That's Hapi's home. And there were elephants, weren't there? Uh, there were elephants. Many the elephants were brought ago. through here by the Nubians and brought up okay. into Egypt. Yeah. 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 So, welcome to my favorite part of Egypt. I love it. It's so romantic. It is. On that note, I'll leave you with Philip. <laughs> <laughs>
Kalabsha Temple dates to around 30 BC, but its new relocated island site shares itself with several other temples. The Temple of Beit al-Wali, built by Ramses II, is a hemispeos temple built to commemorate his war efforts. Reigning from around 1278 BC, Ramses II ruled for 66 years. He built the most amount of temples out of any pharaoh and dedicated them to a plethora of gods. Yet here it is dedicated to Ramses' triumphs. Here we see him smiting a Nubian. The outside shows Ramses' war and trade with the Nubian foe. This is Ramses' pet lion. That's the lion you were telling us about. This is the Nubians bringing the, the lion, the pet lion, to Ramses. And at Abu Simbel, we see Ramses in battle with the exact lion, Mahes. Oh Ramses II had his trained lions brought in from Nubia and had them trained not to kill the Egyptians in the battles. So there's actual evidence that they use lions in battle. It's not just a myth or a legend. No, no. We have... At Abu Simbel, we can see Ramses II on his chariot with his pet lion running next to him. This exact lion. Oh, yeah. At 3,300 years old, the temples of Ramses at Kalabsha might seem old, but there are even older remnants here. Some stela show ancient life from pre-dynastic times, even showing an elephant. Our ride to take us down Lake Nasser has finally arrived. The private Sai Safari boat. One of only a handful of boats that recently offer this unique experience. Cheers! Cheers. Oh. You excited? Discovered we have our own balconies up here. Oh. Hello. Hello. <laughs> After a little break in our neighboring master rooms, it is time for lunch. Bon appétit. And lots of beef. We are incredibly lucky to be sailing on the Sai, going further south on the expanse of over 350 kilometers of Lake Nasser, something that has only recently reopened up for tourism. Our voyage is engulfed by history, relaxing, and creativity. That's what I'm going to spend my time doing uh, on this boat. It's a bit like dogs in their own, isn't it? Stephanie, are you ready to set foot on an island in Lake Nasser? It's my first time, it's your first time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have one. We are the only boat out here for miles. We are completely isolated. No electricity, no telephone lines, no signs of life for miles. As night rolls in, we take a moment to remember the ancestors of the men who work on this boat who are relocated because of the lake. Good morning from Lake Nasser. It's been my biggest dream to be on this lake. I can't wait to explore more later.
The crew sets sail further south towards our next historic site. But first, breakfast. Omelette et tagine. Mm. Full. Mm. As we pass through this incredible landscape, we pull ashore and see our next relocated temple in the distance. The Valley of the Lions, Wadi Sabua, built by Ramses II. I'm going to take you into the side chambers. These are decorated exactly like you will see at Abu Simbel in the yes. side chambers. Blue and yellow, so lapis and gold. Really made from lapis and gold? Well, the blue is lapis, yes. yes. So, come see. The yellow represents the gold. In here is Ramses II offering to different gods. Here is Ramses offering to Sekhmet. So you see the gods have got skin made of gold. That's why they are painted in this yellow color. And Sekhmet was the god that you told us about yesterday. Yes. Who had to be tamed by having beer that was tinted red so that she thought she was having blood. Exactly. That's Sekhmet goddess of war, which was quite handy for Ramses since he had so many wars. Mm -hmm. Ramses down here, I have no idea who's standing here no, because he's the gone. hieroglyphs are gone and he's gone. That's okay. We come down here. I presume it would be Isis or Selkit. We can't actually tell because the hieroglyphs mm -hmm. are totally, totally destroyed now. And what is he pouring here? So here... He's pouring out from the jar just water over a mound of what would be flowers, something like that, purifying mm -hmm. them before the goddess. Uh, here we see him again, Ramses offering to Osiris, the god of the dead, the god of the afterlife. Yes. Next to him is Geb. Now, Geb, I'm wearing Geb's bracelet. Oh! Exactly. So that's Geb, the god of the earth. So afterlife and this earth, Ramses appeasing both of them. Mm. Hedging his bets nicely there. Exactly. Behind you here, we have the beautiful goddess Isis. Here she is. They've got Isis and Osiris in here. Not sure who he's offering. Well, that's Ramses there. Here he's offering to Atum. Atum is a very special god. He is the god of creation. He created himself and then created the universe. Yes. And he's offering a sphinx, as you can see. <gasps> so each god is getting a different offering. A different gift. We have Hathor, the goddess of love and music over here. And she's getting... She's getting incense. Ah. Yeah. And then we have Horus or Ra Horakti right here being offered also probably a mound of perfume. Yeah. It really brings it to life looking at it with you. Because I see beautiful images, but I cannot possibly pick out who everyone is, what the offerings are. Yeah. It's wonderful. I've been studying this, these temples at Lake Nassau for two years now. Oh my goodness. I haven't, I haven't been in here, but mm. I know it like the back of my hand. <laughs> so it's quite special to come in here for me as well, and now to yes. bring you. So. Oh, I love it. We're going to have a great time seeing the others. I do have something to test you with, though. Yes. Test me. It's got nothing to do with ancient Egypt. What are the eggs? They're super creepy. Uh, geckos? Are they geckos? Gecko eggs, yes. They're so beautiful. They're all different colours. Pink, blue, yellow, orange. So there's still baby geckos in there because they haven't hatched yet. I dare you to poke one. No, poor little thing's not ready. Can you believe we're here and it's just our group? What an experience to be able to see this without tons of tourists around, isn't it? It makes it feel like 1910, doesn't yes. it? Just the early age of travel. Even the way we travel. I know, we our, up boat. our boat. <laughs> yeah. Up on a desert hill awaits our next relocated temple. I was expecting Lake Nasa to look a bit like the banks of the Nile. All the way around is extremely verdant and green. But there's nothing. It's, it's like a lunar landscape. It's so otherworldly. I wasn't expecting this at all. Dating to the 3rd century BC, this is the Temple of Dhaka, dedicated to the god of wisdom, Thoth, began by Ptolemy IV in collaboration with Meroetic Nubian king, Archimani. 
This stands testament to the trade relations between Nubia, Egypt and Greece. The next temple is undecorated and dates to 10 BC around the reign of Roman Emperor Augustus. This was a nice detour from the group. Huh? Was it worth it? It was worth it. This was all Stephanie's idea. Yes, of course it was. Yeah, I know. No, it was. No way. Isabel thought it was your idea. I said no, it was Stephanie's idea. No, it was my idea. <laughs> was it good? It was amazing. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, it was amazing. Oh, good. Was it decorative? Or is it just Yes, the first floor was painted, and it, we, there was another temple and went even further. Oh, did you? And that one had columns. Oh. After another day of sailing, we arrive at our next visit, the temples at Armada. This entire mountain was relocated. It is not a temple, it is a tomb, built for the chief priest and representative of Ramses VI in Nubia. He was Penaud. Just a few hundred meters away from the tomb of Penaud is another relocated temple, the Temple of Der, built by Ramses II. Inside this temple, we get some of the best examples of ancient Egyptian color. Such as this scene of Ramses II as a high priest wearing a leopard dress. This next little temple was saved from the flooding of the lake in the 60s in one entire piece by placing it on sledges and hauling it into place. This temple was built by Tutmosis III. The colors, the preservation, absolutely stunning. So that there, Stephanie, is the Temple of Amada. It's at this point that you really realize that you are going deeper into Africa. As we approach the bank, they scan for eye shine of crocodile, and one unlucky man pulls the short straw to moor the boat in for the night. With a little South African wine. Coming out of my room named Nefertari on the Sai boat, looking across at the temple of Ramses and Nefertari. This is such a privilege. The temples of Ramses and Nefertari were the most difficult to move. The entire mountain was relocated. This is incredible. Yeah. I, I, I keep losing words because it's so perfect. It's, it's just so perfect. I've been wanting to come here since I was 18 years old and I've never made it each time I've been to Egypt. This is the first time and this is the perfect way of arriving. I can't believe it. You really find the best ways of arriving at temples in style <laughs> on the back of a pickup. <laughs> And here we are. I'm so happy to be here with you. The facade features family members and four statues of Ramses. At the entrance above is a statue representing the Pharaoh's name personified. After the majestic scene of Ramses II at Kadesh, we see Ramses returning to Egypt, Stephanie. 
with the blue crown on, holding the soul of Amun. Here is his horse, but his pet lion, Ma Hes, leaping forward. See how happy the lion is? He's at a great war. He's, He's at a great him. war. And they are being taken all the way down. You can see Ramsey's uh, soldiers over here bringing in different captives. Here we can see they are bringing in Libyan captives. The captives that we saw as we came in. Yes. But here is the pet lion that clearly survived the war. Mm -hmm. In this scene, Stephanie, we can see Ramses II, the pharaoh, offering jars of wine to another god. Do you know who this god is? No, I don't recognize that one. This god is Ramses II himself. No, come and on. He is. This is Ramses now, fully deified. He's wearing the ram's horns of Amun. The same ram's horns that Alexander the Great adopted because of Ramses II. He wanted II. to be the new Ramses the Great. Exactly, exactly. Well, as Percy said, he's got quite the ego. He does, but at this point in his life, this was justified. What age was he around the time that he had Around this? the time that he had this made, probably about 40 years old. Mm. Um, simply because we do know that the temple next door has a very sad story. The temple that Ramses built for the love of his life, Nefertari. The ultimate wife, she supported the pharaoh in more ways than one. Here, Nefertari is actually in battle with her husband in Libya. Nefertari shares this temple with another goddess. On all of the columns, as you go through towards the sanctuary, there is the goddess Hathor, the goddess of beauty and love. The inner sanctuary shows Nefertari protected by Hathor, with Ramses offering to them on the side. The amazing thing here is that Ramses and Nefertari are shown at the same height on the exterior of the temple, and that is unique for any queen in ancient Egypt. What do we call this in Egyptian? Fah. Fah. In South Africa, we say braai. Braai. You know what, Stephanie? What? Don't you think we should just like sell everything and move to the desert? <laughs> really? No, but it sounds fantastic on camera. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> and with that, sadly, Stephanie had to leave to catch her flight. So that's the sketch that I did of him of uh, Abdul from our wonderful party last night. I have to show you. Yes, I did you. Abdul, eh? Abdul. Ah, yes. yes, yes. <laughs> bon appétit. <Yeah. laughs> it's like looking in a mirror. Oh, it's Stephen Hawkins. Yeah, that's good. It's okay? It's okay. Okay. Yeah. We are here at Abu Simbel overnight on our Lake Nasser boat, the Sai. So we're going to see the Abu Simbel sound and light show. Front row, Abu Simbel, sound and light. Let's go, guys. Let's do it. 